thanks for coming back. We are about to do a respiratory review. Remember in my class to study the highlighted material, that way we all have an understanding of what's supposed to be studied to master for the test. And as always, whatever your teacher asks of you, please do that. I would like to tell you maybe that I was a respiratory therapist and this topic of respiratory is the bomb and I am the bomb at delivering it. We're gonna do the best we can with it. Very interesting though, lots of neat physiological processes that I have picked up on when it comes to the respiratory system, some important processes. So come over here with me for just a minute. My name is Daryl Barnes and I'm glad you're here today. As the air comes into the body, it comes through the oral and nasal cavity into the back of the throat, which is the pharynx. The larynx is the voice box. The trachea continues downward and there is an interesting cartilaginous feature called the carina, which allows the trachea to split into the bronchi. There are primary, secondary, and tertiary bronchi, which go down to the bronchial level, to the alveolar duct level, and then the alveolar sac level. So let's go back and talk about a few interesting things that I have picked up and noticed. In the inside of your nose, there are these concha, conchi. And these little rolls inside of your nasal cavity create turbulence. Why is that important? Because that helps heat the air that comes into your body. It helps in filtration. Remember, you kind of have some nose hairs at the front that capture things. And fitting along with that are goblet cells which secrete mucus. These line the respiratory passageways. Ultimately, what this mucus captured is captures is swallowed. You sneeze it out, you blow your nose, or it dries up in these hairs in a flaky form, which requires your maintenance at some point. Interesting, right? The hyoid bone is the only non-articulating bone in your entire body, and there are muscles in your neck attached to that, to the base of your skull as well. Some of the cartilages in the laryngeal area include the thyroid, cricoid, epiglottis, corniculate, arytenoid car cartilages. The arytenoid corniculate crowd, that is specifically what puts stress on the vocal folds uh, right below the vestibular folds to help influence pitch. How we make high pitch is that there is a narrow glottal opening. This is a high tension on the vocal folds. If the glottis is more open, that, has, that creates less tension and results in low pitch. Let's go down to the microscopic level just for a moment when we talk about alveolar histology. The type one alveolar cells are squamous cells. They make up 90% of the alveolar wall. Type two alveolar cells are the ones that secrete surfactant. These are cuboidal in shape. About 10% of the alveolar wall is type two alveolar cells are type two alveolar cells. Macrophages are dust cells and these go around cleaning up and digesting, taking out debris. Kind of interesting to me how that our lungs from top to bottom, there's kind of a gravity feed thing going there. And so it's really nice that we have the ability to cough to get some of this trash up and out of our lungs and we don't just fill up, fill up from the bottom up when it comes to our lungs. Notice that one of the big features on the left lung is the cardiac notch, it accommodates the heart. The left lung has a superior and an inferior lobe, and notice that the right one has a superior middle and an inferior lobe. Both lobes have an oblique fissure, right oblique, left oblique, uh, but the right lung has a horizontal fissure separating the superior and the middle lobes. The apices of the lungs are way up high, and then the diaphragm is the lower boundary, allows your lungs actually to kind of curve downward in the back. Because of the liver, the right diaphragm is a little bit higher, especially when you look at it on an x-ray than the left side. On an x-ray, remember that there's gonna be a, a, an air bubble in the stomach usually, which most people think is a tumor when they look at it, just a radiolucent area. 
Let's talk about inspiration and expiration for just a moment. Inspiration is an active process, and in that process, the diaphragm is depressed as it contracts. The ribs flare up and out, the external intercostals come into play, and that creates an increased volume inside of the lung, chest area, and it causes air to come in through negative air pressure. When we look at the lungs, the indented area on the inside, that is called the hilum, and that is where the primary bronchi, the pulmonary arteries, and the pulmonary veins enter and exit from each lung, right and left. Whenever you undergo the process of expiration, these muscles, the diaphragm, and the external intercostals just simply relax. Remember that on the lungs is a visceral pleura, and then there's a parietal pleura around the lungs, and then there is a serous fluid that helps to lubricate the lungs so that as you breathe in and out, you don't rub a blister. That's a nice thing. Let's talk about some of the lung volumes for just a moment, and there is a pretty major difference between male and females. The amount that we breathe in, in every breath, in and out, it's about 500 milliliters. It's about, the, about as much as you would have in a plastic water bottle. The amount that you or I could breathe in past that tidal volume is called the inspiratory reserve volume. It's about 1,900 milliliters for females, 3,100 milliliters for males. The amount that you can breathe out past the tidal volume is called the expiratory reserve volume. The inspiratory capacity, what you can breathe in, is 2,400 milliliters for females, 3,600 for males. The amount that you don't control is called the residual volume, and it's this portion down at the bottom, roughly about 1,200 milliliters, 1,100, 1,200. Vital capacity is the amount that you control. 3,100 for the ladies, 4,800 4, for the guys, milliliters. And the total lung capacity is roughly 4,200 milliliters for ladies, 6,000 for the guys. Remember what a two liter bottle looks like? You can carry one of those in each hand. So if, if you're a male, then you have the capacity of about three of those. And if you're a female, looks like you have about the capacity of two of those. Hyperventilation, or maybe breathing too fast, results in a high pH or alkaline result. In hypoventilation, not breathing enough or enough to clear out the CO2 results in a low pH or an acid result. Hypoxemia is where there is not enough oxygen in the blood, and hypercapnia is where there is too much CO2. Remember that this ultimately will be controlled by the medulla. And we'll talk about that in just a moment. But before we get to that, I just want to make the comment that if the alveolar pressure, partial pressure of oxygen is high, and then the capillary that's coming by is low, then the oxygen is going to move from the alveolus into the capillary in the lungs. In the capillary, surrounding these little alveolus if the CO2 level is high and then the alveolar pressure of CO2 is low, then CO2 is going to diffuse into the alveolus. And this opposite type system happens at the tissue level from the blood into the tissue cell and out. One of the major energy features in your body is the production of ATP in your mitochondria. And because of that, you and I produce lots of CO2. It's a waste product. product. It's colorless, odorless. You're breathing it out. I'm breathing it out. I'm breathing your CO2 in. You're breathing mine. Fortunately, it's colorless and odorless, and we're all not disgusted because we're having to deal with someone else's CO2. That's nice. In your body, though, there are central chemoreceptors in the medulla that detect high amounts of CO2, which also I'm gonna kind of show you in just a minute how that high amounts of CO2 produce lots of hydrogen ions. And this stimulates uh, the dorsal respiratory group in the medulla oblongata. This also in turn stimulates the ventral respiratory group. This as a result causes hyperventilation, causes us to get rid of CO2 and then returns 
this chemistry back to a normal stage and this inhibits the ventral respiratory group so that your breathing or my breathing goes back to normal. Your body also has some other abilities to, that affect breathing as well. If you have a drop in the partial pressure of oxygen, carotid and aortic bodies, these are peripheral chemoreceptors, pick this up, these are in some vessels above your heart to increase breathing, to uh, increase the oxygenation ultimately. The other input, which I think is so interesting, is emotional. Some of us, when we get upset emotionally, we have an anxiety situation and we begin breathing a little bit faster, we get flushed. And so I think the thing that I keep going back to so many times in teaching anatomy and physiology is how much your emotions affect your body, positively or negatively. It's something to think about. Interesting. Surfactant is a detergent in effect that reduces the surface tension of the liquid inside of your lungs, the water, so that it doesn't adhere and cause the alveolus to collapse. If the alveolus collapses, it is called atelectasis. There is gaseous exchange that occurs across the moist surface of the alveolus and into the blood and then from the blood back into the alveolus it occurs in both directions and this is basically almost on a microscopic level very tiny and specific how this happens it's surfactant that helps to keep these little alveoli from collapsing on themselves because they're so tiny let's talk about co2 in the tissue and what happens and how that CO2, that waste product, is eliminated from the body. One of the things that is very important to remember about gases is that they move according to their concentration gradient, meaning that if the CO2 in the tissue is high, then it's going to move into the blood where the CO2 level is low. If the oxygen level in the blood is high, it's going to move into the tissue where the tissue oxygen level is low, so it's downhill. Remember that when it comes to gaseous exchange. As the CO2 moves into the blood, remember this. Some of the, the, the most lovely things about drinking a carbonated beverage is the bubbly stuff, but your body can't dig bubbly CO2, gaseous CO2 in the blood. And so what it does is it binds with hydrogen, uh, it is dihydrogen oxide, that is true, but it binds with water with the help of carbonic anhydrase to form carbonic acid. It then disassociates into bicarbonate and hydrogen ions. So you can see how that if a person has high CO2, that it can result in high hydrogen ion concentration, which is a low pH. High hydrogen ion, low pH. Remember that, low on the pH scale. This facilitates the movement of CO2 in the blood in a soluble form. The problem though is as this bicarbonate moves out into the blood, there is an electrochemical gradient that is created and then chloride ions diffuse inward to help balance this gradient. Whenever these chemicals get back toward the, lung, the lungs, then these chemical processes reverse with the help of carbonic anhydrase so that CO2 can eventually diffuse outward into the lung and you can breathe it out. The water, probably most of it, is retained in your blood. At the same time, I would fail miserably in this discussion if I didn't talk about what happens with oxygen. Oxygen in the reverse pathway binds to hemoglobin and several things help influence the movement of oxygen into the tissue. If there's high temperature, high hydrogen ion concentration, high partial pressure of CO2, this triggers the release of oxygen into the tissue. And the opposite is, is called the Bohr effect. If there is not high temperature, if there's not high hydrogen or not high PCO2, if there's low metabolism, then it does not encourage the dissociation of oxygen from hemoglobin. 
Remember too that carbon monoxide binds to hemoglobin about 200, 300 times stronger than CO2 or oxygen. So therefore, if you or I get poisoned with this incomplete combustion product, a lot of times the cell will just have to live and die and be replaced. It won't let go, that's what I'm trying to tell you. Carbon monoxide oftentimes won't let go so that a healthy chemical CO2 or O2 can, can take its place. Well, let's talk about hyperbaric oxygen therapy for just a minute. The reason that hyperbaric oxygenation is important is that some bacteria grow well in an anaerobic environment in anoxic conditions. And so by driving oxygen into the tissues, it helps to inhibit the growth of some of these bacteria. I can remember back in the 80s, there were celebrities who felt like that this was the fountain of youth. And so they purchased these units, these hyperbaric oxygenation chambers so that they could live longer. Interesting. When we talk about lung conditions, you and I know about emphysema, asthma, and lung cancer. And almost every one of these, not almost all of them, have either they're caused by cigarette smoke or they can be triggered by cigarette smoke. So think about those. And I can remember the day, I can remember the day when if you got on a public transportation on a bus, then everybody smoked. And I can remember when we had smoker sheds outside of the external entrances. And then I can remember when we went to completely no smoking. So this has evolved quite a bit over the years. And I think it's a good thing to eliminate one of the, the major causes of lung cancer. As a matter of fact, it is the number one cause of lung cancer, cigarette smoke. When there are irreversible changes in the airways of the lungs, that is called chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, and there are several different causes for that. Also, I was reading about pneumoconiosis, and this occurs and leads to fibrosis of the lungs after a person breathes in dust or certain particles that are inflammatory to the lungs. As we move down to almost the smallest level of the lungs, we have the bronchioles. And right before we get to the ducts and the alveolar sacs, there is smooth muscle around this, these ducts. And if that smooth muscle contracts, we have bronchoconstriction. And if it relaxes, we have bronchodilation. And I believe that those who have problems with asthma sometimes have this bronco constriction dilation as a complicating factor. There are two more items that I want to talk about before we end this video session. Number one, if you go straight back, that's the oropharynx. Go back and up, that is the nasopharynx. Go back and down, that is the laryngopharynx. Also, when you are an, you or I swallow, there is a cartilage called the epiglottis that covers down over the opening of the trachea so that we don't aspirate food or get stuff down the wrong windpipe when we eat. Brody's the one that helps me videotape a lot of these videos and he mentioned after this throwdown on the respiratory system, well, what about yawning? And apparently yawning helps get rid of collapsed alveoli and helps a person get their entire inspiratory capacity. And as you and I know, they seem to be contagious I saw somewhere that they are also sometimes associated with a vasovagal response in excess. Also hiccuping, what about that? There's another one that's kind of associated with the respiratory system, a diaphragmatic issue or spasm, possibly C5 phrenic nerve associated with that. You've heard about a gazillion different ways to get rid of hiccups, you know, drinking from the opposite side of the glass, scaring somebody. I don't think that anybody has the real answer to that, but, uh, but it, we should not get out of this respiratory topic without talking about yawning and hiccuping. Comment, leave your comments, tell us what this is all about. Keep coming back. Holla out loud, answer the roll. 
Say it like you mean it, not just present, but president. Not just present, but president. Not just present, but president. I just want you to get bossy with your education. Be the disciple. Keep coming back. Remember, A is for excellent. B is for better. And C is for super.